Hey, it's Mark Wilson, the Land Geek with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's podcast, I've got a big deal. And I'm really excited to interview her. Scott Todd is out today. So I'm just going to get right into it and skip the pleasantries. Dwan Bent Twyford is our guest. If you're not familiar with Dwan, she is known as the queen of short sales and is considered to be the nation's number one expert on short sales and foreclosures. She's written two bestsellers, Short Sale Pre-Foreclosure Investing and How to Sell a House When It's Worth Less Than the Mortgage. Duan, welcome. How are you? Hey, I love the energy, Mark. Thanks for having me on your show today. I am so excited to talk with you because this is a, a subject that we don't really hear much about. So let's rewind the tape and okay. kind of... Tell, tell us, like, how'd you become the queen of short sales? <laughs> well, uh, how far back do we want to go? We want to talk about the short sales or what led up to it. How far back do you want to go? Let, let's let's go to how did you get started in real estate? Okay, so uh, I was married. I had a baby. I was thirty. My daughter was eight months old. Her dad and I split up super unexpectedly. So basically, I was broke. I was a single mom. I didn't have a husband. I I uh, really had never had any like real jobs, you know, and so it was sort of one of those like kind of like a come to Jesus moment. Like, am I going to get a job? Am I going to work for myself? How am I going to raise this kid? So it was one of those where I just really didn't know what to do. And I was already 30. And, and honestly, I had been, <laughs> I had been fired from quite a few jobs in my 20s, including I was fired from Denny's. Denny's, no third shift. Like who works 10 at night till six in the morning and gets fired at like 3 45 in the morning so i thought okay so that's uh clearly not not the plan for me and i honestly you know so this would have been i'm in my 60s so this would have been uh in the 90s and you know back then we had to use a classified section of the newspaper and so i was looking for jobs and a lot of multi-level marketing just a lot of things and uh, i met these people and they said oh i buy houses we fix them up we sell them and i thought okay that sounds like fun i could do that buy houses decorate, sell them, that'd be perfect. And not realizing that rehabbing and decorating are not the same thing. So I, I got my first house literally with the intention of just decorating it, making it look amazing, selling it, and I'm going to go off and do real estate. And uh, so I, I learned how to rehab. So I rehabbed for a long time, uh, about a decade. I rehabbed a long time. And I started wholesaling, you know, flipping houses quicker, faster money, didn't have to break my back anymore. And then deals got tight for a little while. And I really just started calling the banks and saying, hey, can you take off you know, this fee and that fee? And just asking for little bits of money off of the closing statements. And they were saying, yes. Like, like not even like, well, hang on, hold. It's like, uh, okay, sure, just boom. And so I always think more is better. So after I got three or four banks to knock off, you know, 2,500 fee, a 5,000 dollar fee, then I wonder if they would take money off the mortgage. Let me try that. So I literally just like fell into it. I started asking them to take money off the mortgages and they were like, okay, you know, let me call you back tomorrow. And, and there was no real term in the nineties. People were calling it short sales and discounting and shorting and like 10 different terms. So I started doing hundreds of them and I actually went trademarked and coined the term short sales. No kidding. I wrote, yeah, I had the registered trademark on short sales as it relates to real estate investing. I always have to clarify that because short sales apply to the stock market, they apply to a lot of things. Um, so I have the registered trademark for short sales as it applies to real estate investing. And then I wrote a book, short sale pre foreclosure investing, and then pff, I was the queen. <laughs> yeah, you're the queen. So <laughs> this, describe for us, what is the definition of a short sale? So short sale, uh, and, that is, and thanks for that question. That is a good question. A lot of people uh, don't know exactly. So basically, I am finding homeowners that are in the foreclosure process. They own their home. The bank is in the process of taking their house away from them. And maybe so they I haven't paid my mortgage. You haven't paid your mortgage in maybe six or eight months. You're on the foreclosure list at the public records, you know, where you find your tax things. The foreclosures right. are there, the divorces, the bankruptcies, the probate, people that haven't paid taxes, all the public records. And I find you and I market to you. And uh, through a conversation, I find out maybe you, Mark, have 
a $200,000 house and you owe $200,000 and the bank's going to take your house, you can't keep it. You are, you're mentally, you want to move, you're done, but you owe what it's worth. So all the other investors just go pass and they walk off. Right. There's no, like there's that. no equity. There's no Correct. meat on that bone. Yeah. So I call the bank and I talk to this department called loss mitigation. I say, Hey, I'm Don and Toyford. I don't tell them I'm the queen of short sales. <laughs> I don't tell them I wrote a book either. <laughs> I, right. just say, I have this deal and I'd like to make an offer. I'd like to offer you, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars as a full payoff. So the bank has to approve it. And I send them in uh, what I call a short sale package some low comps, a list of repairs, some things to warrant the bank taking such a giant discount, as well as a full letter laying out a timeline if the homeowners would file bankruptcy. Because, you know, bankruptcy, they can live there for like two years. Right, and, right. And if the bank's saying no mortgage payments for two years, they have to pay real estate taxes, they have to pay forced insurance, they have to pay, 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 pay. You're going to get this much money here, or I can give you the same thing today. So the bank says, okay, we'll take 100,000 as a full payment. Now I get it for 100 and I can wholesale it. I can rehab it. I can keep it for a rental. I can move into it. So I have options to do something else with that property. So they're short So sale. now is this going to be economically dependent? So I can imagine in 2008 to say 2011, you must have had your best years ever. Is so that- many. And, you know, the thing is, and that is a, a good point. So in like eight, nine, 10, yeah, people were, banks were doing short sales like crazy people. And then the markets, like right now, your markets or houses are still selling. And, you know, but what people don't realize is you have to look at short sales from the bank's point of view. So if the market is houses are going on the market and they're quickly selling, but someone still owes what their house is worth and it still needs $50,000 worth of repair, and the person files bankruptcy and does all these things, the bank is still going to be stuck with this property for all those quarterly reports, year-end reports, the loan loss reserve, all these things. So if you can look at it from the from the bank's point of view, there's never a time that banks don't do short sales. They always do them. So so in any market, there's always short sales. Always. Any so market. What, okay. So in every niche, there's something that sucks about it. What sucks about short sales? Well, I I would say for now, for me, <clears throat> I like to negotiate. Okay. And I like to be like a super great negotiator and have like all my little uh, pulling my little tricks out of the hat, you know. And so I think a lot of people are probably intimidated by the fact that they actually have to negotiate the deal with the bank because if you're not a negotiator or you're shy or you don't like confrontation. Maybe you wouldn't like talking to the bank, but I look at it like, okay, I got Mark, the loss mitigation rep. I got my homeowner over here. I'm on my homeowner's side. This guy's going to agree with me and I'm going to show him offer A, offer B and offer C and he's going to agree and I'm going to win and I'm going to help this person. So I like the negotiating because um, I get to be a little bit snarky because I'm a super mm-hmm. nice person. So I get to be, I get to be a little snarky and like, I get to like, be hard now. Like this, these are the numbers and, you know, they're going to file bankruptcy and this is it. And these are the card hold facts. And so I, I get a sort of, I think a little piece of my personality kind of gets to come out that, that wants to just show you how smart I am. <laughs> so, so I like that part, but some people are like, oh, I called the bank and they said they don't do short sales. Like, but the department is called loss mitigation. Like it uh, looks right in the title. <laughs> That's what right. they do. And so I think some people, I would say the only main thing is that people would be intimidated by the bank. But what they don't recognize is that loss mitigation person is like a gatekeeper. They get paid okay. a very minimum wage. They answer the phones. They just deal with one troubled house after another. That's all they do all day. And it's kind of like a crappy job within the bank. Okay. Like the average loss mitigation, the turnover, they only last like seven months. Wow. So when you can come into this person and say, hey, listen, I do short sales for a living. I've got a package ready. I'm ready to close. I can be out of this in a week and get this off your books. Like I'm your girl. They're so happy to hear instead of me saying, 
Uh, so I took this seminar and I learned about short sales. I'm so excited to do my first one. And that person is thinking, I don't have time for you. So we don't do them. And they hang up on you. They just get rid of you because you don't know what you're doing. Right, so it's the approach. Right. I do this for a living. I've got a package ready. I've got money ready. I can close. Boom. Uh, I'll be your best friend. And, and the loss mitigation reps, they get paid bonuses for getting properties off the books. You know, they make, they, they get property bonuses per property. They get them quarterly based on how many deals they were able to mitigate and get off of the, the books of the bank. So they are so excited to do a short sale as long as you don't call them up with, you know, 2000 questions because they don't have time. Okay. So uh, I, I'm getting educated. I read your book. I take your course. I know everything there is to know about short sales. I know how to find the short sales. I know how to negotiate. I've got all my paperwork. I can get a package. I've got one problem, Juan. I can't close. I don't have the money. Where's uh, the, where am I going to get the money? So normally, and this would again be based on where you're at in your investing career. If you were new, I would say wholesale the deal wholesale to a rehabber or a landlord. And you can find those. I mean, they're everywhere. You know, they have all those RIA groups, real right, estate investors right. associations. There's a million RIA groups around the country. So you can you can find any deal, get it short sale, go to a RIA group, and there'll be 20 people that will buy this house from you. So if you're new, new, let's just say you have a $200,000 house. The bank takes 100. You can, you can wholesale it for 130, make 30 grand, you don't have to come up with any money, no down payment. You don't have to have any cash. You sell it to the landlord or the rehabber, and the title company will creatively use that money to fund the entire deal. And I can just assign the contract to my friend in the RIA group. Basically, yeah. It's not quite as simple as an actual assignment, but basically. You can put it into um, uh, LLC or land trust and just change the beneficial interest on it and just be done with it. So it's, it's very, very simple. And I really recommend for me personally, when someone comes to me and they're new, like fresh out of the gate, new, like wholesaling is a good place to start because you can wholesale these houses for 25, 30, $35,000 a deal. And you don't have to have money because the person you're selling it to has money. And then, you know, I used to rehab a lot. I mean, I've rehabbed Gosh, I don't know. I've rehabbed hundreds of houses. So I used to rehab for a long time. And um, I, I still like rehabbing. I just don't do it very much because at this point, I'm like, mm, it's too much physical work for me. I don't yeah. have time to follow up. I just, it's not my thing anymore. Um, but you, know, you can rehab them. Uh, I have moved into a couple that were just beautiful, beautiful houses and thought, I have this house for 50%. I'm moving into, moved into a country club house with a big pool and diving board and lived there for like five years. It was amazing. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, I like the idea of just shuffling the paper and making money. Yeah, me However, too. my next problem is scale. So I'm in Arizona, yeah. you're in Colorado and Florida. Now you're in Ohio. And I contact, you know, my local Wells Fargo and I see, oh yeah, they've got a short sale in, Delaware. And I can, you know, it's worth 200. I can get it for a hundred. Do I have to jump on a plane and look no, at this no, house no, in Delaware? No, I, I never, I haven't seen a house for so long. Uh, I think in the beginning, you know, it's like you and I talked about when I was interviewing you in the beginning, I feel like we all want to see the houses. We want to see the land because we don't have the confidence to do deals that we haven't seen. So I tell people now, I say, listen, when you start working with me, you have to treat every single person, even if they live down the street, treat every single person like they live out of state because you would not fly out of state to look at a house, but you'll drive down the street to look at a house because it's down the street. So if right. you really want to be able to scale it and you want to be able to do more, you can have some bird dogs. Um, you can have people in your office that do the short sales for you. <clears throat> the banks now, when you do a short sale, you can actually charge um, a negotiation fee. You can charge a relocation fee to relocate the homeowners. So you can build a lot of fees into there. So the person like me is making like the full $30,000 check is mine. And I got the bank to pay the homeowner 6000 to move. 
I'm going to negotiate a 5,000 to negotiate and I'm making, we're making bigger profits now than we used to because the banks will pay for so many things. So you can okay. find houses anywhere. There's real groups everywhere. You could advertise anything on Craigslist, you know, anywhere. And people will call and, and we'll jump on it. So I, I always tell people you should do deals all over the country. Don't limit yourself to where you work. Interesting. Interesting. And as far as volume of deals, if I was just getting started and I was trying to convince, <clears throat> uh, let's say my spouse, that, <laughs> Hey, I've got the ultimate side hustle. And, you know, I, I, I listened to the one and I can make, you know, X amount of dollars on this short sale. I'm going to do X number of deals this year, just wholesaling them. And I'm going to make this much in cash. How much can I realistically, if I go through the training, I do everything you tell me to do, how many deals can I realistically do my first year? Well, you know what? And there's no set answer, but I tell everyone, if you can do one deal a month, one deal a month, because a lot of people have a job, like you said, they have kids, they have this, they have that. They, they don't, don't want to dive straight in without some kind of income. So I tell people, look, if you can make the, my average student makes 30,000 per deal. So if you can make 30,000 a deal and you can do one deal a month your first year, you made $360,000. That's a good amount of money. And then, so one person alone could probably do about 20 deals at a time. But after that, you would have to have some assistance to help you with just, you know, like the VRs, like, yeah, like the, um, the VAs, you'd have to have someone sure. helping you with the paperwork. You'd have to have somebody organizing the closings, making sure the paper, you know, um, I call those, um, oh, I lost the word. They're like my coordinators, um, my closing coordinators. So you, so at some point, if you want to do more than a couple of deals on a monthly basis, you would need to have a few people to assist you with the paperwork, the closing, making sure the rehabber has you know their stuff done, making sure everything's organized and lined up. But I, I would say for an average person, 20 deals a year is something that a person could do working for themselves and not having to have a bunch of people and not being overwhelmed with the amount of work and making a really super good living. That's a really super good living. That's super good. So you make a lot of money. And you know, and the thing is like, you know, I, I'm up here in Ohio right now. Well, over here in Dayton, they have houses that are like $45,000. Now, everything is based on what you're used to. So where I live in the mountains, well, just in Denver, just in Denver, period, there's nothing. There's no such thing as a $45,000 house. In Denver, like the hood, the hood, hood, hood is $350,000. Right. So there's there are nothing. There's no forty five fifty thousand dollars houses. So you have a three hundred thousand dollars house. You should make about ten to fifteen percent of the value of the house as your assignment fee. So okay. if you're living someplace with fifty thousand dollars houses, you're probably going to make five grand a deal. If you're in some place with three hundred thousand dollars houses, you're going to make thirty grand a deal. So I'm like, if you live someplace where the houses cost this much, work someplace where the houses cost more. Because it's the exact same work. It's the exact same phone calls. There's nothing different except some extra zeros at the end of your paycheck. Right, right. So there's nothing to stop. I mean, I, I imagine there's not a lot of short sales for million dollar plus homes, but maybe there are. Oh, there are a lot. You'd be surprised. A lot of people, you know, are all, they have all these big fancy houses and they get laid off for the economy. Like something like COVID comes along and these people can't afford these big old houses anymore. And so, and then of course the government did all of those forbearance agreements, like that gigantic 18 month forbearance agreement. So that's actually coming to a head because many of the people, like millions of people can't make up the back taxes or the back payments. They can't make up the back payments. Uh, the bank is taking some of the back payments and putting them on the back of the loan and you pick up, but only if you had a job and you didn't live up on employment and government stimulus. So the people that were like, woohoo, we don't have to work. We don't have to pay mortgages. We're just going to like ride this wave. Those people right now are losing their houses in droves because the bank will give you a chance, but you have to be worthy and prove you can make that payment that you didn't make for the last 18 months. So there's a, there's kind of like a wave coming of people that are going to find themselves 
inadvertently in foreclosure or behind on payments because they took advantage of that nationwide forbearance agreement, which I've been preaching on my podcast the whole time. Do not do that. It's a bad idea because when it comes to the end, you're going to end up getting yourself in trouble, maybe even accidentally. Yeah. So what are the big gotchas in your, in your niche that people need to look out for? Um, really, you know, it, there's really nothing. I mean, you can sell, you know, you know, you can sell any house, you can sell any land, you can sell anything if it's priced right. Right. So it just has to be priced. I mean, I, I've sold houses where the roofs were falling in and mold was everywhere. And I, my very first house, and I did not know what this was at the time, my first house I ever did, she was a hoarder. And I had never been inside of a house of a hoarder. I didn't know what a hoarder was. And I just remember there was like a path through the house to the couch. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this mess in here? Never seen it. Didn't know what it was. It, she had cats and dogs and she never let them outside. Like the whole house was full of wine bottles and cigarette cartons and thousands of cans of cat food. And I mean, I, I don't even know how the woman lived there. Um, so I actually, this was my first rehab. <laughs> I got a bunch of dumpsters into the house out, got this house fixed up. But um, now you know, that show came on. I'm like, oh, buried alive. Ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, I know what that is now. I've done some houses like that. So I think that for, for anyone, it's a matter of just getting it priced low enough for whatever condition it's in and what the market is calling for, for you to be able to wholesale it. Because like a landlord, someone that says, you know what, I'm going to keep this house and rent it. They'll pay about 80% of the value. Okay. But a rehabber will only pay about 60 or 65% of the value. Okay. So if you got a hundred thousand dollar house, two hundred thousand dollar house, and it's trash, then the rehabber is going to want to buy it for like 110. Right. You have to get it, you have to get it low enough to make the deal work. And then if it's a really super nice, clean, 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 clean house, I'm going to take it and do a subject two with it and keep it. Okay, so let's discuss subject two. Turn it into a rental. I'm gonna turn it in, not a rental. I'm gonna turn it into a some monthly cash flow. So I've done uh, like 357 subject twos. Okay, so this this find what a subject two is. So subject two uh, is basically a homeowner is behind or not. Some people they're not even behind, and they agree to deed their house to you. They deed their okay. house to me. And then I become the new owner. Their name is on the mortgage. I'm the owner. I make an agreement with them in like five years, you know, I'll refinance the house and take their name off of it. So they're kind of set free from it. And they do the house to me. And then what I do is I turn around and I find someone like you that says, hey, I'd like to buy a house, but I had good credit. And then I had some credit issues and I want to buy a house but I can't qualify the bank, but I look at your situation. I look at your credit and I see a lot of good payments, maybe a health issue. Bank's going to make you wait a million years and punish you. I will sell you that house and give you a mortgage on it. And you'll make payments to me. I make payments to the bank. And I, I take it subject to the existing loan and I turn it into long-term cash flow. I love that model. Subject twos are so much fun. So there's a few things on those. Like, for example, someone is deeding their house to me. So my first question is always, what about the Joe on sale clause? But no bank, no bank is going to call the due on sale clause when the mortgage payments are being made again. They don't care right. where they come from. And I tell the homeowner, listen, you have missed 12 payments. I'm going to make all these payments on time. Every time I make an on-time payment, your credit will get better. Right. So you trust me for these amount of years, your credit will get better and then you can buy a new house. And this person over here that wants to buy the house, but, but doesn't quite be able to go with a bank, but it has a good down payment. They'll give me the down payment. I'll make up the back payments on it. If there are any, they'll make a payment. So I'm a bank. I'm basically a bank. So I get all the write-ups that a bank would get. And I tell sure. this new person, listen, you have five years to get your credit straight. As a credit repair company, do this, do this, do this, get your credit straight because I got this guy at the other end that doesn't want to be on this loan for the end of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm the bank. I become the bank. I own the house. I give you a mortgage, an actual mortgage. You file your mortgage. 
and I get all the tax write offs of being a bank. So I don't have repairs and something breaks. I don't want to call on me. I'm the bank. So subject twos are great. Subject twos are amazing. So is this now, They're is this fun. what you call pre foreclosure investing? That's the, the other book, How to Sell a House When It's Worth Less Than the Mortgage? Yeah. Yeah, so when we when we wrote when I wrote the first book, the we sold a, a kajillion of them, and so the um, publisher says, "Hey, listen, would you write a book for homeowners, but to help homeowners get out from underneath their houses because everybody was so upside down?" Sure. So in that book, I'm like talking to a homeowner. Like, listen, you could find an investor and do a subject two with them. You could short sell the house and sell to somebody. You could do this and this. I gave the homeowners all these options that they have um, besides just going to the foreclosure. Cause you know, you go to the foreclosure, it's on your credit report. Um, if the bank, and most people don't know this, if the bank doesn't sell the house for what you owed, if they sell it for less, they come after you for the difference in the money. Mm-hmm. So you lost your house on foreclosure, you owe 200, the bank sold it for 150. Guess what? You owe the bank 50 grand now. And or you get a 1099 and these people are like, I got a 1099. I lost my house five years ago. Why is the bank coming after me for money? So I kind of, uh, I, it was, it's a good book. So I gave homeowners like, these are all the things that can happen to you if you just let your house go. So let's don't let those things happen. And, and basically I encourage everyone to work with investors. Okay, fantastic. But if I want to learn more about subject two investing, this Go is to my the website. Book I have to my website. website. Yeah, well, I have. Uh, I I talk about subject twos. I talk about short sales. I talk about wholesaling. Uh, I talk about rentals. I've got free eBooks for people, and uh, I do a lot of webinars on subject two. I love subject two. I love it. I'm loving all of this. So, Dwan, I got to ask you, what's the worst advice you see or hear given in uh, short sale investing or subject to investing or pre foreclosure investing? You know. Um, I don't know that it's the worst advice I hear, but I think one of the worst people that start off investing now, I feel kind of sorry for them sometimes because someone can be just a great internet marketer and make you think they have decades of experience and you spend, you know, five or $10,000 on some crazy training program. And then you find out, you know, you, you get no callbacks. No one's helping you. A person isn't what they said they were. And so I feel like for the newer people, you really need to find someone like you, someone that's been investing for like 20 years. If they haven't gone through like the eight, nine, 10, and they haven't gone through the COVID, they don't need to be giving you advice on, on how to do stuff and, and selling you a bunch of, you know, ultra super expensive coaching programs when they're just really good marketers. So I feel like people need to look at the person. So if someone sees me, they'll go, oh, she's a great marketer. Well, I'm not. I have a good team. <laughs> I have marketers. I'm just really smart. So they can. So I think if you want to learn anything of real estate, just look at the person that you're looking at investing with and really look and see what they have personally done before you go in and say, hey, I'm going to learn this thing. It's like with you, if you had only done five land deals, I probably wouldn't want to spend, you know, 10 grand on a coaching program, but you've done 6,000. I'm like, I'll pay you 50 grand. I want to hear what you have to say. Right, so right. I think I mean, I, are, yeah, I, I, I love that advice. More, yeah, people need to do a little bit more due diligence because, I mean, you and I both know, we see people all the time selling this program, selling that, and, this, and you know that person, and you know they haven't done five deals. It's right. like, oh. So I just tell people now, it's a good idea to look at a lot of areas, like land is a good area. Subject twos are great. Rentals are great. Storage units are great. Wholesaling is great. Short sales are great. Do a little research, listen to some webinars, listen to some podcasts, and find the people that you feel like your moral compass aligns. And if you feel like your moral compass aligns, that's probably a good person for you to work with. It's great advice. It's great advice. Well, Dwan, your your mentorship this podcast has been invaluable, but now we're at the point of the podcast where I'm going to put you on the spot one more time and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actual. But before you do that, I have to give a shout out to our sponsor, which is flight school. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up the mountain of land investing 
quickly, safely, efficiently with Scott Todd, who's done thousands of deals. He will take you up there so safely and you're gonna start building that passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents. And oh yeah, that tuition investment for flight school ain't gonna cost you nothing. Guaranteed, you're gonna make it all back 180 days or less. Just show us your work, that you're doing it, that you're executing. So learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, the landgeek.com forward slash training. See if this model is right for you. Dwan, Ben Twyford, what is your tip of the week? So uh, it takes a nanosecond to explain. My biggest tip, especially if someone, maybe they're hearing me or you for the first time, is if you are in your head, I would like to be a real estate investor. Do not listen to the naysayers that are in your family. Your friends, your brothers, your moms, your dads, they will say, you can't do that. It's a bunch of get rich quick stuff. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And the people that love you the most will talk you out of something that could be life-changing for yourself. So I say, don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to anyone that makes 15 bucks an hour. If they're, if they're not millionaires, don't listen to them. And don't let other people get into your head and cloud up what you think you would like to do for yourself. And then just do it. You have to just do it. I love that advice. You just have to do it. I, I had another guest say, never listen to your parents. And he was being serious because they're just filled with fear and anxiety. And it's coming from a place of love, yes. but it's not good advice. No. Because my, they, my dad, I love him, but they were factory workers. Work for the man 40 years and retire. It's like, mm, no. Yeah. My, my parents still don't understand what I do. Like, what do you do? How do you do it? Hey, um, I told them about a bunch of buildings. Like, why would you do that? You're getting ready to retire. I'm like, I am? Well, I mean, don't you want to quit? It's like, but it's my business. I built it. I love it. Why would I quit doing this? Like, what else would I do? I love this. So they yeah. don't understand why I'm not like, you know, starting to relax and sell things off and kick back. It's like, dude, I have pink hair. I'm not ready to be the old lady in the rocking chair. It's not happening. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm never going to retire. I, I, I love working. I'm a, we're like, we're like deal junkies. We're, we're not going to yeah. retire. No, no, I love what I do. I'd be 95 yeah. years old. If I can still get up on a stage, I'll still be teaching. Absolutely. Same. Yeah. Same with me. I, you know, <laughs> wheel me up there. That's right. It's fine. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I'll still be doing land deals. Yeah. So it's great. I may do a um, couple now that I know you. I may like, Hey, give me a little bit of advice over here. It sounds like a fun thing to learn. No worries. No worries. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about making some real money shuffling paper and making that passive income in subject twos, go to thewonderful.com. I'll have a link to it. Um, and if you check out her site, tons and tons of information. And, you know, when you go to the site, like you'll see, Dwan's a big deal. Like she's been on national media. Um, so tons of information there. Get the books, start learning more. And um, Look, you know, I, I don't care how you could have solo economic dependency, whether it's raw land investing, subject to short sales. I just want you to get out of it because once your passive income exceeds your fixed expenses, you're working because you want to, not because you have to. Life is just better. And that's really what yeah. it's all about. So, Dwan, are we good? Yeah, I'm great. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, listeners, my podcast is the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. Tune in, listen to me and listen to Mark. Get involved, man. We just want you to get involved. Real estate is an amazing thing. Absolutely. And I want to thank the listeners and remind them the only way, the only way I'm going to get the quality of guests like the one Ben Twyford is if you do three little things. Follow, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review. Support at thelangeek.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. So please do it. It really helps. Um, all right, Dwan doesn't know what I'm about to do here, but I always here's how I always end it. One, two, three. Let freedom ring. Ring, yes. Let freedom yes. ring. <laughs> I All love right. it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.